I am not as hopeless as as I think sometimes you might get the impression if you read a few little bit of what I wrote. I am actually, I wouldn't say, I, I, it would be, I think, a little bit Pollyannish to say I'm hopeful, but I am, uh, I am convinced that we have the social fabrics to, to face this problem. It's just that we can't, we, ha we, have to, we have to reimagine them as we go to adapt to the new conditions that we're constantly facing. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Jeff Mann. He's been an INET senior fellow. He is the chairman of the Department of Geography at Simon Fraser University. He's written fantastic books about macroeconomic discipline. In the long run, we are all dead. And he's, how do I say? If you ask me what's whispering into my ear on my shoulder to how to run INET, he's a core, core individual. Uh, the place to begin, it seems to me, and, and I, again, I think you and I have talked about this before and lots of other folks have talked about it too. Um, the question right now is to, to look hard at what needs to be done, which I think we have a fairly good idea about, at least in some, you know, on some fronts. Um, for example, it seems to me that I think everyone who takes the problem seriously understands the fact that fossil fuels are a huge part of the problem. So we need to wind down the fossil fuel industry. Even saying that sounds laughably utopian at this moment. And I think part of the reason that it does is because we're in a situation where existing institutions seem either beholden to those same industries or the parallel in other sectors, or they seem entirely inadequate to the problem. And so I guess I would say we have two kind of large scale political fronts that we have to take seriously. The first is the nature and scope of the institutions that we create to deal with these problems because the existing ones are either inadequate or need to be tweaked so radically that we have, you know, institutions that actually have a purchase on the problem. And we also need, I think, to, to think hard about the, the, the nature of the authority of those institutions and the ways in which they're managed democratically. And I think, and I think I can speak for Joel too, though I don't want to speak, uh, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth. But I think that there is an assumption that the only way we can solve this problem is an authority that is so great that democracy is effectively in the way. We have to move it out of the way to get the technocrats or whatever is in charge to handle this. And this is, of course, what Joel and I were calling climate leviathan. But I think that, in fact, the real solution, if there and there's going to be uh, if there's if there's a solution, the real solution is actually to take multiple forms in the communities in which people live. And that means that the response needs to be democratic. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the institutions that can confront this, despite the fact that it's a global problem, will be grounded in communities where people are actually dealing with the implications of climate change that are already underway, as you've noted before. And we were t talking just before we started about Arjun and his you know, labor to, to document what's going on in India. The Indian state and the Indian people cannot wait around for Glasgow or another cop to create a regime that will somehow help them endure what's coming down the pipe from climate in India. And the same is true here in Northwest North America, the same is true in New York, the same is true across the world. And so I feel very strongly that despite the fact that there's temptations for a centralized response, that that response needs to be democratically accountable to institutions grounded in the communities in which people live. We can't be handing power up to the same institutions that have failed us over and over. And the global regime itself, of course, is, you know, has produced nothing thus far. So the, the faith in, in the next COP seems to me entirely misplaced. Um, I, I'd be glad to be proven wrong. But at this point, I'd rather bring it down to the ground. Yeah. Well, there's this, you might call we're in this kind of awkward environment where the meta needs frighten people who want to experience democratic control. Mm -hmm. So so I think you're you're in this environment now where young people, ambitious people, live in that kind of micro environment of how can I get ahead? 
and getting ahead means not offending our mm -hmm. institutions. But where leadership is needed right now is to confront and go beyond some of those institutions. A lot of people on the left are saying what we need now to quote Lori Wallach, who I made a podcast with this last week, is people power. Like the bottom up says, you got no chance. At some level, by shifting the parameters of what it means to political survival, maybe they can preserve democracy and urge or a call to action. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, and, and, and the, other, the other dimension is, Jeff, and I'm, and I'm really interested in your thoughts on this, the, the disparagement or the lack of trust and faith in expertise, which is probably deserved because a lot of people with credentials became marketing agents for power rather than what you might call seers of the global public good and what was needed. But, but we're, we're in a place right now where the susceptibility to demagoguery is much greater because expertise has failed. Mm -hmm. How do we restore trust? In, I mean, there's some great scientists out there. How do we, how do we restore trust in them? You watch this craziness in the United States and everywhere else about dealing with the pandemic. Oh my God, we got to open the restaurants. Oh my God, this and that, this and that. We, using the New Zealand example, we could have shut this thing down months ago and saved trillions of dollars, and we didn't do it. That's a failure on the scorecard of expertise and political power that is etched into everyone's mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, bleeding a bit here, but how do we restore not only the faith in but the tr and the trust in, but the power of common good expertise mm -hmm. to prevail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that... I don't have a single answer, of course, and uh, I'd be suspicious, I guess, of anyone who did. Uh, but I think I, you, I, I wouldn't be suspicious of you. I just think you were a genius because <laughs> we're, we're all struggling to find it. <laughs> you think I was a liar, which would be fair. <laughs> enough. But uh, I think uh, that the, the one of the one I think one of the challenges of, of working through this problem because you are right it, it, there and it, there is a tendency I think on the part of folks like me and I don't want to speak for you but maybe folks like you too you know who who are uh, embedded enough in existing institutions of expertise that we have a tendency to trust those experts be, maybe some people even think of us as experts ourselves whether we merit it or not and and so it, it's a suspicion that seems outlandish or irrational to us do you know what I mean? To, to look at a climate scientist and say it's all a hoax driven by China's effort to stymie American growth or things like, you know, those seem like absolute and complete absurdities. And so how could we possibly even fathom a conversation that begins from that point? Um, and part of the problem, I think, is the fact that for most folks, and I speak for myself here as well, it's just I don't think about it often enough, the problem of expertise is inseparable from and embedded in the problem of the institutions themselves. It's not like we mistrust the expertise and the institutions themselves are fine or the other way around. Those two things are the same. It's the institutions that implement the expertise. The way that people experience expert knowledge and expertise is through institutions, if that makes any sense. And right now, as you've said many times before in our conversations, those institutions the, the principal ways in which expertise gets communicated, that those institutions have lost a lot of le legitimacy, both at, at the global scale, certainly, um, particularly, uh, I would argue, uh, the American institutions have lost a lot of global trust. The idea that at one point the U.S. might lead the planet, if that makes the right, if that makes any sense, uh, has very, very little purchase uh, outside the United States anymore. Um, and those kinds of, but the, but the institutional mechanisms through which expertise gets kind of played out through policy and all other stuff are 
have not adjusted to this new reality, if that's what it is. And, and so I guess I would say part of, the, part of the task is that because of the lack of legitimacy of existing institutions, especially in their capacity to deal with something like climate, and especially to deal with something like climate change in anything like a just manner, is that we've built, those institutions now have built into what we, how we understand the future, a series of expectations of breakdown, decay, collapse, crumbling. And insofar as we expect that to be the way that our institutions manage or help us cope with the coming changes, insofar as that's what we expect, we have a much greater chance of that being true. What we need is institutions in which people expect to find support, expect to find uh, some forms of stability, some forms of provisioning. Right now, those don't exist. And I think that it, so managing the people's expect, not the people's, people's expectations and uh, thinking hard about what needs to be done is all about the re-legitimization of those institutions. But your work on macroeconomic policy is also very important. And what I see right now, and I'm going to get, I'm going to pay real tribute to a man who was a dear friend of mine since the 1980s, has passed away. And that was Paul Volcker. And mm -hmm. Paul Volcker was, he knew how, uh, I, he was a fishing buddy of mine originally. And we worked, and then eventually I was the chief economist of the Senate Banking Committee, so I was doing the Humphrey Hawkins and confirmation hearings, and then he left, and Greenspan came in, and the whole nine yards. But Paul said to me late in his life that he was very concerned that what was created in the policy mix, the monetary fiscal policy mix, and you've written books on Keynes, that's why I'm putting it out, was that it's okay to drop interest rates to zero because it amplifies the value of assets concentrated in the plutocracy. But it's not okay to use fiscal policy aggressively because what's on the horizon is taxes potentially for rich people. Mm -hmm. So the distortion in what was called an independent central bank or a monetary fiscal process was the political economy of pushing people to fortify the wealthy and to constrain the risk of taxation of the wealthy at a time when globalization and automation were exacerbating inequality and what we needed was a massive transformation of the education system to create more knowledge intensive rungs in the ladder and we didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And we turned something that used to be called tax evasion into tax avoidance. It became legal to keep your money offshore and then to come back to the American people and say, we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So you have a very, very corrupt dynamic. And Paul was more than terrified as he watched people like Ron Paul and his son Rand Paul going after the Fed because he didn't know how to defend it. Hmm. He didn't know how to defend central bank independence. When you wouldn't buy municipal bonds, when states are budget constrained and Wall Street's made a mess, and we're in a downturn, and you're supposed to be having quality law enforcement, education, and infrastructure. But we can buy the bad stuff off the balance sheets of banks or mortgages, but we can't fortify those communities that are the victims of the downturn caused by Wall Street. Paul used to sit at lunch with me in his last three, four years just ranting about this stuff. And I'm bearing witness to it today out of homage to him. But you, in your book on Keynes in the long run we're all dead, maybe not quite so what you might call with the tentacles and grip of all the details of political economy. But you were, you were seeing the nature of the policy mix being off course. And then mm -hmm. earlier, Keynes was seeing that. And mm -hmm. you were illuminating that. And Paul was seeing that. Mm -hmm. 
this isn't just about the environment. No, agreed. And in fact, that's a that's a crucial. You know, if 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 you and I can get one message across from this meeting, that the, the idea that it's a uh, it's not just about the environment because nothing is ever just about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, that is a crucial point. Absolutely. Right. But I, one of the things that it's interesting that you bring up Paul Volcker. You know, who's legendary for lots of reasons, probably. You know, uh, and, and I think has a you know a, a complex legacy in terms of his. You know, policy, yeah. if, you know, because he's yeah. so closely associated with that one moment. The inflationary Reagan, late Carter and Reagan. Exactly, right. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, when he ends up, uh, if I'm correct, you know, uh, advising the Obama administration later in his life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that that's something that less people know about. Most people think about the Volcker shock or the Volcker coup. Um, and mm -hmm. I guess I, I, I would say that one of the things that, is cr a crucial dimension of, of Keynesianism as I understand it, but is a dimension that I think we need to think hard about and maybe be a bit more suspicious about, is the idea that institutions like the Fed or central banks more generally are themselves, that they contain the answers and we just need to, to manage them well enough to express and communicate those policy answers. I am not so sure that saving central banking, as it sounds like Volcker was wary that, or, or worried that he wouldn't be able to do, I'm not so sure that that's where our attention needs to go right now. And I'm mm. not sure if that's what you're saying. Yeah. But I guess, what, I guess what I'm trying to get at is at the heart of Keynesianism, as I understand it, and Volcker would be a yeah. great example of this, is in some ways it's a, it's a larger kind of management of the social order. And that's what he's afraid of, of course, when you hear like Rand Paul and Ron Paul taking apart this crucial institution. And of course, I would never myself endorse Ron Paul or, or Rand Paul's, un, you know, m complete misunderstanding, I think, of, of the Fed. I would be sympathetic to their suspicion of the embeddedness of the Fed in a system that is disequalizing itself. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so that there's means, a false faith. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm going to give Paul credit in a way that I think addresses the, the, the correctness of your concerns. When you were our senior fellow, you and I were planning a conference in Washington, D.C., which the pandemic derailed. And I was prepared to walk onto the stage at the opening and dedicate that conference to two strange bedfellows who had died. The first was Paul Walker, and the second was William Greider, who wrote Secrets of the Temple. And Paul, who was my friend, encouraged me to work with Greider, which I did in great detail. And at Bill Greider's funeral, I gave one of the eulogies. Hmm. And you know what I stood up and said? About two months ago, as he knew he was dying, Paul Volcker said he wanted to get together with Bill Greider. And Bill had broken his hip and couldn't do it. Paul was frustrated. And Paul said, I know I gave you the green light to work with him. I told Paul my ground rules where I won't gossip about when I was inside the Fed, but I'll talk structurally and try to keep this guy being on course. But Volker looked at me when he knew we weren't going to meet. And he said, and I quote, you tell him when you see him that while it was painful for me, that's the best goddamn book that was ever written about central banking in the history huh. of the world. And I said that at the funeral of Bill Greider during my eulogy. And a man named Peter Osmos, who had worked during Watergate at the Washington Post with Bill Greider, his public affairs press is a fantastic organization, and Paul's memoirs at the end of his life were published here. And Peter jumped up and he said, he said the same thing to me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I wasn't dreaming. Yeah, yeah. But Paul was seeing the contradictions, and he was seeing the misuse 
of central bank independence, that it wasn't independent, it was getting captured. Mm -hmm. That's why he talked about the municipal bonds not mm -hmm. being bought, but the bailout of mortgage toxicity being bailed out. And he right. was deeply concerned, not that the central bank was right and needed to be put back on track. He was deeply concerned that the central bank was off track and we were going further off track with all of our institutions. Right. And so I, your concerns are very valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my experience of Paul is that he was aligned with you and I and seeing something he had tried to achieve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and seeing deteriorate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. opening the gate to a pandemonium. Right. And how do I say? I watched him restrain himself in the years after Alan Greenspan took office because he didn't think it was honorable to take the person who succeeded you and become critical. Right. But he told me one of his greatest regrets late in his life, when all the bubbles built up and everything to the great financial crisis, he said he'd had too many terms. I should have started earlier in my not criticisms of Allen, criticisms of the structure of Fed policy, which, by the way, right. Ben Bernanke, who's another friend of mine, was in charge of by that time. But I guess where I'm going with you, because of the multidimensionality of your awareness of these critical government institutions in relation to a market economy, is that we're off, we're off course a lot more than just climate. Mm -hmm and the whole notion of globalization is eroding the power of the nation state to protect people. It's feeding despair. Mm -hmm. It's creating a yearning which authoritarian demagogues play into. We work, the frontier upon which your work is based on lots of different, what I might call signposts, lots of different issues is in jeopardy. I mean, the quality of humanity in society is in jeopardy across a large spectrum now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe climate's the most important. We can tolerate asset bubbles and bailouts a little bit, but if we lose oxygen and water, we got a problem. Yeah. 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 But I really do, I really, Jeff, I just, you know, I, people ask me who are the greatest scholars. And I sit there in this kind of way station called on it watch. To me, the greatest scholars are people who ask the most important questions. And I think you're, you're right there. Oh, I appreciate that, Rob. I, I do. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, it's, it's the... The questions are the center, the centerpiece right now, because they lead us to look in different directions. If we can write that, ask the right questions, I totally agree. And I do think too that there's, you know, there's, like, I mean, for lack of a better way of describing it, it does feel like whether we are or not, I don't know, but it feels like we've had, we've we're at a hinge point where the lessons of the past, upon which we've usually built our knowledge and understanding of where we're headed, those seem less and less useful to, to a lot of people. You know, there seems to be a, you know, a kind of disjuncture between the, the, the past's capacity to allow us to understand where we're headed. And that, I think, is a sort of terrifying feeling, not just for average people, but mm -hmm. I include myself in that group, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and that changes not just our expectations of, of, of what kind of futures our children might have and those kinds of quite daunting things to think about, as you know, but it also changes our understanding of what we can do with the tools that we have at our hands. And right now, there's an extraordinary amount of distrust in those tools. And I actually think, as you just said, that I think right at the intro, those, that distrust is quite legitimate. And so the question is, do we put our effort into uh, re-legitimizing the tools that we have, or do we construct new ones? 
or at least try to think differently about what, what, the, what we do with the ones that we have. And it's actually interesting to think of the connections between our first part of this conversation and, and some of the stuff you just raised around, say, you know, the purchase of municipal bonds. Well, if we look at how we're going to deal with adapting, if that's the right term, to climate change's impacts, we're going to do that at a local level. The city, as an institution of governance, yeah. is going to be crucial to any effort like that. The only way that it's going to be able to manage to do so is to fund those efforts. Municipal bonds will be a crucial tool to that, to, to, to the democratization in some senses of our capacity to manage what's coming. Mm -hmm. So we could argue that the institutions exist and we just need to think differently about them, or we could think harder about a kind of more radical rethinking of the way in which we fund or don't fund, uh, in, uh, what's the right word, infrastructural efforts. Um, I personally think that what we're going to need to do is, is we're going to need to set aside prioritizing market-based solutions, and we're just going to have to start doing shit. It's the only way that we'll, we'll get this done. Yeah. Um, and that might require, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms that don't try to optimize the efficiency of our path forward in a kind of Nordhaus model. It's going to require, I think, much more radical policy commitments that maybe, like you said earlier, are going to re just require our social movements or mass movements to push them forward. I don't know what that will look like, but I do think it will be, it won't be one movement. It will be a whole series of movements, a whole series of, of uh, responses to crisis and other kinds of challenges as they unfold. Yeah. Um, so as, I, as, I, as I, I am not... Might... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I am not as hopeless as, as I think sometimes you might get the impression if you read a few, little bit of what I wrote. I am actually, I wouldn't say, I, I, it would be, I think, a little bit Pollyannish to say I'm hopeful, but I am, uh, I am convinced that we have the social fabrics to, to face this problem. It's just that we can't. We ha we have to. We have to reimagine them as we go, to adapt to the new conditions that we're constantly facing. But mm -hmm. I, I really do. I, I I and I look at the younger generation, many of whom are really politicized and care so much, and and that also motivates me a great deal to try and, yes. ex you know, to try and communicate that we can build, we we can build visions of the future where we trust each other. Mm -hmm not where we turn on each other. And we can do that by, by democratizing the movement effectively, by, and by, by democratizing our institutions that exist to manage the problem as it comes. I, I actually have a fair bit of hope. I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer you a, a phrase that complements with any of what you're saying. We're not only gonna democratize, we're gonna de-plutocratize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you a story now with our mutual friends and some of what you've been saying. Uh, Naomi Klein is someone I've admired for many years. Her husband, Avi Lewis, and she had been friends. And they were very close to my wife and I. And we're very much cherishing the, our first daughter, Sarah. It was before Toma, their son, was born. And Naomi used to talk with me a lot in the presence of Sarah about the daunting challenges before us, climate change, the book she wrote on Donald Trump, and what have you. And uh, inspired by Naomi, Sarah insisted and took her little sister Dylan, and I took the day off, and we went to the climate strike in New York in March. And we went to see Greta Thunberg, who knows Naomi, and we, she had talked with us about on a number of occasions. About uh, a month later, after my board meeting at INET, a number of my board members were at the house for dinner. And I've told this story in a couple of other podcasts, because it's very germane to where you're talking right now. And Sarah sat and listened to these adults and one she calls Pizza Man, because he helps her make pizzas on the grill when we're in California. 
another one who took her to meet AOC. Wow. And all kinds of things. And Sarah's this young person. She's nine and a half at the time. And she listened to our concern, not unlike the conversation you and I are having. And she went silent. And she went to bed. And I drove her to school the next morning. And she didn't speak, which is very uncharacteristic. She went to her first class. She had a new iPhone because kids, their school moved between different buildings. And so they asked us to get the children the phone. Her second period was a study hall. At the end of the study hall, on my phone, I get a little image, which is a poem. What is everything? By Sarah. What is everything? Is it all essence? Or is it all answers? Is there more? Why am I all covered up? I never see past, nor present, nor future? Is it all an illusion? Why is it all collapsing and destroyed? All those lives not knowing. Will we ever know? I took that home one week after she wrote it. And by the way, I wasn't happy and proud. The fact that she was at nine years old carrying that kind of weight felt to me kind of the energy like you and I are exploring today. But I took that, and Pope Francis was running an event in uh, Azizi before you joined me in another event on curriculum reform. But it was the, the early one. And he was talking about, you got to listen to the youth. And I read that poem. And he read it and translated it into Spanish and English and read it to youth groups all over the world. But her disorientation is, at one level, just like you said to me moments ago, an impetus and an encouragement, because they're recognizing the lack of coherent structure. Mm -hmm. And they're mobilizing but at the other level, it is a description of the anxiety we're all wrangling with now. Mm. And I think that you're, you're seeing what's being planted in the heart of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. What's being, what you might call, illustrated valiantly by Greta. Mm -hmm. And, and We've got to push ourselves when we can't go back mm -hmm. in a whole lot of realms. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic, I'm, my joke these days is it's the best unmasking we ever had to wear masks. Yeah. Because it's, it's taken the curtains back on so many things. Mm -hmm. And you're working in all these different facets of political economy. And the way you and Joel saw what you might call the anxious trade-offs mm -hmm. between mobilizing to get it right, but then having this authoritarian overlay. There are a whole lot of people anxious about U.S.-China relations now, because the U.S. is wallowing and taking care of vested interests, and the Chinese are stepping into the point. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that they're not you might call the thing that made you anxious with Joel right. as a long run non solution. I'm not, I'm not, how do I say, I'm seeing their structure as responding to the challenges of African development and various other things and disease mm -hmm. as becoming perhaps uh, attractive in a way when people aren't recognizing the downside. Mm -hmm. of the long run of moving governments to that place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the urgency of knowledge is really strong. And it's very compelling. And failing, like we're doing vis-a-vis -vis the pharmaceutical industry, we're failing. As we're watching fires in Turkey this morning and all over the Pacific Northwest and Canada. By where you live, what I mean, how people, how people look in the mirror 
who are political leaders and accept that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how you can. Yeah. I know but you must be able to because they all do it. <laughs> um, the, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think sometimes I, I, you know, without in any way, way trying to let uh, the folks in charge off the hook, I do think that the, the constraints are binding in ways that we don't always understand. And I don't mean that I understand and the rest of the world doesn't. Sure. I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I do think if, if the world has a sort of disastrous or calamitous momentum right now, that can't be, in my view, just attributable to the spinelessness of our leadership. Hmm. It's something deeper than that. Yes. Um, and and identifying exactly if we could, maybe it's not even something we can ever be exact about, identifying where and how the, the weaknesses are that need to be addressed is, is one of the most significant challenges that we could possibly face. And I do think that part of the problem is that we don't even have a language to talk about that in a sense. You know, we, we turn immediately, maybe I don't mean to say you or I, but, or, or anyone in specific, but I do think in general, we turn immediately to, to solutions like, uh, solutions like, like a a particular set of tax policies or, uh, you know, the, the convening of a new international meeting. And I think in some senses, those are superficial attempts to address what are actually much greater structural problems that are effectively mm-hmm. sedimented from compromises, if that's the best word, mm-hmm. over decades. Do, do you know what I mean? So that when, yes. for example, Volcker takes charge of a Fed that could liberate hundreds of thousands of people from poverty and wants to do so, the institutional momentum is such that it's still impossible for him to do so. Mm-hmm. And I guess part of what Joel and I struggle with, and, and we, you know, as you've, you've read the book and you know that we, you know, we're very imprecise on what the solutions are because we, we don't know. But we do think very strongly that, and I, I, I guess I'm speaking for him, I apologize, Joel, if you're listening, but uh, that, that the solutions are likely going to require a radical rethink of our institutions. The the idea that we can just turn the treasury around to a climate fix seems to me kind of utopian, to be honest with you. And I mean that in the negative sense. Yeah, like false resolution. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's awkward, of course, because I don't have the answers any more than anyone else. Um, but I do feel very strongly that that the place we need to begin is admitting what we don't know and therefore need to think hard about. And right now, a lot of the time we're acting like we have the solutions, we're just not implementing. That doesn't seem to me to be very clear. Yeah. Yeah. It, this is, this, you're, you're what, I'm, what I'm saying about you and Joel you should wade it into the right water with the right question without having what you might call a, a demagogue like quick fix answer. Mm-hmm. When you talk about like climate and changing the treasury, or you talk about all these different quick fixes, yeah. you can understand. I mean, this is this is not unlike, you know, people talk about Donald Trump as a demagogue. You know, Lots of people project false certainty and until they're unmasked as having been false are treated like heroes because they've alleviated people's anxiety. Mm -hmm. And grappling with the real questions and staying in them, not letting go with the question, but not pretending to have answers that are false resolution, that takes courage. Mm Yeah, I'm not sure if I have it, but I agree completely. And, mm-hmm. and those that do uh, are are you know worthy of our 
our trust, I guess, effectively. Yeah. You know, those are the folks that we need to listen to right now. You know, I, I worked for six years on Capitol Hill. I know a lot of people in the Senate and the House for those years. And I was interested in, as you were talking, about what are the constraints. And I'll tell you the one that keeps coming back to me, because I've heard it in about 19 different forms. Rob, you're right, but I can't commit professional suicide. Because mm. if I'm not in office, I can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. So first you got to survive before you can try to do good policy. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these people understand where the, the hierarchy of committees, the role of money in politics, the nature of, which you might call, disparagement by media. It's, it's, sicked upon them by the wealthy and the powerful. They, they experience all of these refractory influences. I gave a talk the other day where I said, what I'm very concerned is how can young people find the roadmap towards the truth? Because the arts have been commodified, education, is increasingly privatized and commodified. The mainstream media depends upon advertising from the powerful, and the legislature depends upon campaign contributions. So in, if you want, say in a large sense, the refractory influence of money on the democracy that's supposed to be governing money, is quite pervasive, and it's been unleashed more in the United States than in the city of Earth. I think your own country has a better sense of balance than, than we do. But it's a very, very hard thing once you know a politician to be, to be like aggressively critical of them. Mm -hmm. Because the smarter they are in understanding the context in which they live, the more conflicted they become. And I do know a United States Senator, who I will not name now, who in the prime of his career left. And I had dinner with he and his wife. I worked with him a lot when I was there. And he said, Rob, a lot of US senators are alcoholics because you spend 75% of your time raising money and most of that money you're raising is asking you to do something to the detriment of the people who elected you. It's very hard to live with that. Mm -hmm. That's an American story, but I think mm -hmm. where are the dilemmas? Who wants to be made a knight or an emperor or get awards in other countries? It's not always cash. It's not well, even cash as survival. It's mm -hmm. about dignity. It's about larger, larger platforms. What we associate prestige with is not always the common good. No. And the people who are the ambassadors for the global common good are few and far between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I listened to a wonderful course recently by a man named Aubrey Hendricks at the Union Theological Center called Political Economy in the Kingdom of God. And the centerpiece, of, we had lots of discussions over several weeks. My job was to come in and talk about what Adam Smith really said in the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, which isn't the kind of advertisements that are used by what you call uh, market fundamentalists. But I joined this group and enjoyed this conversation tremendously. But um, Henrik shared with us a paper called macroethics was about the way in which Mark Luther came to find meaning in his life. And I wish that Dr. Hendricks could brief every senator, congressman, or person in the executive branch because what he planted in the conscience is about what I would call heroism in the present state is really about, and uh, I'll send you a copy of that article. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it, but it's it's there's a deeper challenge 
and some people lose their lives. Some people lose their time in office. But as you've been saying throughout, in your awareness of governance and your awareness of the challenges, we need radical change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I, I think, you know, virtually everybody experiences, you know, I, I, I can't speak for everybody, that's a ridiculous statement, but a lot of people um, experience something similar to, to the situation you're describing, if in less rarefied, you know, institutional settings, and thinking about how and what kinds of changes and sacrifices might be required at the individual level, you know, to address these things. When, you know, when, when we talk about shutting down the tar sands here in Canada, which I would definitely recommend that we do tomorrow, we also have to think clearly hard about the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of folks whose living, require, you know, is, is dependent upon that whole industrial operation. And insofar as those folks, you know, committing to that work, that doesn't make them bad people or weak-spined people. or, mm. or, mm. or it, it makes them people who, like the rest of us, find their lives, for good or ill, entangled in the existing political economy, yes. just like yours and mine. And, and, and helping them and helping ourselves manage the kind of radical transition you're talking about, we don't have to be politicians to, to, to think hard about that. We, we have to think hard about the kinds of institutional fabrics that hold those people in those places, even though they would prefer it to be otherwise. I, I think you know, that task is going to be multi-fronted, if that's the right word. And it's going to require the knowledge that those folks have about how to make those changes. We can't do all that from the top either. So it's really, I think, a lot about bringing this down to the ground. And, and, uh, and that effort uh, is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the role of re young people right now, because they are on the ground by definition. They are it. And they are the base of many of our you know, most powerful social movements right now. This yes, is true sir. in the United States as well. Oh, yes. So that's thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And one of the great things about my job is that I get to hang around kids doing stuff like that all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's if, I'm gonna down, yeah. if, if I'm going to get down, I'm not going to get down talking to a 21-year-old these days. Mm -hmm. They're going to fire me up. I That's great. That. Very, very privileged for that, you know? Well, let me ask you, as we're coming down the stretch here, are you contemplating a new book? Are you working on a new book? I know you've had a lot of administrative responsibility as the chairman of your department, and the pandemic, yeah. and the young family, and so forth. But I'm just curious. Yeah. Are, is there something in your crawl that you're... Yeah. you're there is, there is. It's but it's very uh, inchoate, if that's the right word. It's very, it's in very early stages, but I am wanting to think about, um, for lack of a better term, the politics of uncertainty right now, and I mean that mostly in the sort of not the kinds of expertises that we think we have. I think that the way that we confront uncertainty in our policy knowledge, let's say either in our economic models or our ecological models and the climate models, or just in terms of the, the implications of our policy making, um, the, one of the fundamental assumptions that has you know, been built into a lot of the way that we do that kind of technocratic or bureaucratic work is to assume, as I mentioned earlier, a reasonable amount of political economic stability and institutional uh, institutional, what's the right term, permanence, if that makes, I guess what I'm trying to say is, how do we think about planning for the future and adjusting to the challenges that climate poses when our very conception of what the world will be like can no longer be based on our own experiences? That we need a, an entirely new way, I would argue, of thinking about how we might you know, address the climate problem. So, for example, if we look at the kind of modeling right now, the, the sort of, yeah, you know, integrated assessment models that most climate economics are based upon, 
those those models, there's lots of tweaks right now. People are trying to build thresholds in, you know, say the Gulf Stream shuts down or, you know, the water water is gone from California, those sort of threshold mechanisms that weren't originally in the models. But one of the things all those models do is assume that the contemporary institutions of liberal political economy will last no matter what happens, no matter how hot the planet gets, no matter all of that stuff. But what? how do we think about you know, a future in which the institutions we depend upon now are not there anymore? Then a lot of the assumptions of the models are actually kind of thrown out. So I want to think hard about the kind of politicizing of uncertainty right now, which I think, you know, is happening whether we like it or not. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's in the realm of economics that I'm most interested in investigating that. But as I said, this is all very inchoate. Well, this is very important uh, because at the times when things are uncertain, people yearn for relief. Yes. As the great philosopher Stephen Toon wrote in his book Cosmopolis about the 60s and the Reagan era, exactly at the time when you see the fault lines, exactly at the time when you see what you can't go back to, is when you become scared. And many people lurch back to a nostalgic familiarity rather than push forward to a new right. design. Right. The, and so overcoming the fear becomes central to the task. Absolutely. And that's in part why I applaud the work of you and Joel and you know, your kindred spirits, because I feel like you continue plowing forward. And when I thought about you today, and as I listened to you tonight, I wanted to quote a song from a British band called the Moody Blues. <laughs> The band is, I'm the, old enough to know the Moody Blues. Yeah, well, they have a song called The Question. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking at the door with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war? Because when we stop and look around us, there's nothing that we need in a world of persecution that's burning in its greed. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking at the door? Because the truth is hard to swallow. That's what the war of love is for. It's not the way you say it when you do those things to me. It's the more the way you mean it when you tell me what will be. And when you stop and think about it, you won't believe it's true that all the love you've been giving has all been meant for you. I'm looking for someone to change my life. I'm looking for a miracle in my life. If I could see, if you could see what it's done to me to lose the love I knew, then you could safely lead me through. Hmm. And I think in that despair, in the questions, in what was familiar that's lost, and in pushing forward, mm -hmm. I could see a picture of you, your co-authors, and your sense of purpose. So thank you for being with me today. I hope this is the first of many chapters, but I really want to inspire our viewers and listeners to stay in close touch with your writing and your thinking because none of us feel safe but it's safer to be with someone who has the humility to explore the real context with courage than it is to adhere to some false resolution mm -hmm. that's going to which you might call wake us up to a distress when we realized it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jeff. As always, it's a pleasure to talk with you and to learn from you. Thanks, Rob. I, I, it was a great talk to you. Great to see your face. That's been a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, appreciate you connecting. It's really nice.